and welcome back, guys, to the Improvement Season podcast. It is me, Pascal Floor, and on the other end, it is Steve with a new shirt from our guys from the Netty News Daily, or yes. Netty News, rather. Um, amazing. I was actually thinking about them a couple of times already, of whether we should get them onto a podcast at some point. Oh, yeah. Why not? I mean... Yeah, it's I mean, good. now, I'm, now I'm putting it out there, so it's kind of pressure, <laughs> yeah. right? If we not they get that one, it's like, yeah. <laughs> right, Ada, for some reason, has to come up now. Oh. She's been very needy lately. Wants to uh, say hello so, as well. Yeah, although you can't All right, really see and, and he has his tattoo, of course, as well. I didn't ask for that one to show me, Steve. So show the audience your tattoo. I mean, Can if you, you see haven't it? seen that already over <laughs> on Instagram. Because Steve is now a tattoo expert. <laughs> <laughs> did Slowly. A, did a Q&A am... on tattoos. It was, it, it was more a case. I didn't, I wasn't like ask the expert type of Q&A. It was more like, um, I don't know, questions. The questions that have come in, like, what do you think the impact will be on bodybuilding? Or like, why did you want to get that too, tattoo? Yeah, How yeah. much did it hurt? Stuff like yeah. that. Not like, yeah. I don't know. Ask me anything <laughs> about tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it wasn't like uh i know how to i don't know the ink or any details it's so funny it. because that's exactly what people are doing when they are stepping on stage <clears throat> like here's my coaching service that's basically oh, sure. the, yeah that's yeah, basically yeah. the same principle right you have gone through one competition now you can offer like i don't know <laughs> god just prep coaching or so i that's not what i meant it to be it was more of a case of yeah, like I, i'm gonna I, do a I, vlog ask me about what the i process know was I, like. I'm, I'm just <laughs> mocking or I, I, i'm just yeah <laughs> fucking with you um so yeah i'm not gonna advise i don't know i couldn't my i'm very very new to it all but it's been a steep learning curve and it's been fun but yeah with the natty news guys absolutely um it's really cool what they're doing and uh i'm glad we can now give them a shout out so definitely go over on instagram search i think it's just something like natty news they should come yeah. up you'll see me and pascal are following their account and yeah they do like leroy and the guys are doing fantastic work over there and sharing like natural physiques and like even doing like little clips of like if i share a physique progress update or if you were they'd like grab it and they'd like pick a bit of the text and like share that like a highlight it's it's quite cool what they're doing over there for the natural scene because it's so small really what i find very very cool and this is something that i would tell them as well and i never told them is that they are not creating a um once again a, a, a cult or just like a group where it's like only the people that we like are being kind of sponsored here because that's yes. easy to fall into that trap when people are doing or starting something like that. They may be looking up to someone and they want to be part of the community and most of the time a specific niche then. They want to actually appeal to then a specific group and then it's quite easy to just like serve that group and leave everyone else out. I have the feeling that they are just like interested about spreading the news around natural bodybuilding. And that is something that I find very, very cool. That's really well said because it it definitely, you could easily get into that sort of, uh, that way of being. Uh, I think it could very easily happen, but I think part of, because there's the three of them and they're all like have slightly different backgrounds. They haven't all got like the same coach or anything. They're all a little bit kind of different in their perspective and viewpoints. I think that keeps them quite, grounded and like yeah. keeps many perspectives coming in which is very refreshing actually i've said to leroy um that i find his physique to be massively aesthetically pleasing massively aesthetically pleasing like he has a very very good shape also then the muscles they look dense and full when he hits like the front double bicep pose has a classic to- touch to it as well um just like a very good package overall it's it's great to then see or follow his journey to stage this time um yeah just to reveal what's underneath it all just to actually then see the muscles really coming out and even further enhance that look yeah i think he's like five weeks out from his first show or something yeah uh, something like he's that, working yeah. with cliff so yeah i mean cliff's gonna get him he's already pretty lean so cliff's yeah. gonna get him absolutely dialed in which is exciting <laughs> Very Absolutely. excited for those guys. Um, cool. Where were we going? Should we talk the tattoo? Oh, we kind of touched on that. Yeah. We don't need to talk about it anymore. So you did uh, <laughs> a deload because of that. Or, I mean, you probably planned it like that, that you will be yes. having a deload while getting the tattoo and not because you're having the tattoo, you're actually taking a yeah. deload. Yeah, so it was my fifth week last week. So I was going to be deloading this week anyway. And it mm. just all perfectly landed in place because yeah. I would have... 
it was I actually did train legs on Tuesday, so two days after it. But the day after, I was just like, it was you. It's probably similar to to a very small degree. Any like um, what's it called? Uh, damage done to the body, like there's inflammation and there's water yeah. retention. My forearm, if I just shook it like a little yeah. bit like this, it was just like jiggly, jiggly, jiggly. It's <laughs> funny, right? <laughs> so yeah, it was funny. Um, and you're right. The first night of sleep was not great, but there since it's been pretty okay and yeah. the forearm's not like a like if you got i don't know if you got your quad done like certain areas of your body i can see it being pretty yeah. hard to actually train even like if you got your chest done i don't know if i'd want to train that specifically for a while or bicep like yeah. stretching that in like even when i do i did a few bicep curls today and i was like oh my forearm just feels a bit tight mm. i don't really like that sensation um i don't and it's on your body for life right so you don't want to yeah. mess anything up with the healing exactly. process uh, that's what I said to you, right? You can mess up a tattoo if you're not careful with then the aftercare. But if you t really take the aftercare seriously, you can have like a fantastically looking tattoo for life. Yeah. Right. So, see, I've been washing it three to four times a day and moisturizing it three to four times a day, like yeah. like it's a little baby or something. Let's yeah, but you have to do it thing. once, right? And then you have <laughs> something for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, from it. And thing is, um that if you don't do it then it can look actually very very shitty because if it's <clears throat> if it's if crust is actually building all over the tattoo it draw or pulls out the ink and then you actually have like a kind of more of a dodgy uh, dodgy tattoo which looks as if the tattoo artist did a shitty job when in reality you just didn't really take care of it appropriately and that, that can easily be avoided if you are yeah. just like taking care of it. I was waiting for, because when I, I was looking up like the healing process and what it looks like, I was like, I didn't really get like all the like blood plasma coming through mm. and the bleeding or mm. like ink leaking. Didn't mm. really get any of that. That's and then great. it hasn't, it hasn't like scabbed over or anything yet. I've not got any dry skin. It's just, it's very like, good. it just seems like it's healing like normal skin. <laughs> That's very good. And um, then over the next days, what will happen is that the skin is actually then starting to be a little bit flaky. I don't know how to, else to put it. Like it starts to come off the, the upper layers of the skin. And you're very tempted to just like always pull, pull it a little bit, right? Because like it just scab. hangs there very loosely and you could pull it away, but you shouldn't, right? And it's also then the time when then it starts to itch and just a tip for you when you when you can't really stand that itching anymore just give it a little bit of a slap that often yeah. helps i know exactly uh, yeah i've done that tactic before on other things so yeah i know exactly what you mean. <laughs> um, out of interest pascal what was your longest sitting for a tattoo it must have been eight hours wow yeah because i found myself like one of the hardest things was after about three hours, I was like, mm -hmm. I fucking need to move. Like my body was just like, I'm Th That is kind of the normal length. Like after two to three hours, the body is actually getting into a state where it's ver becoming very, very uncomfortable and also very painful. I've heard once and I don't, I never really followed it up. So, um, because I don't know, for whatever reason, I never really looked into it, but I, I heard or read at some point that when it comes to adrenaline, um, at some point you kind of, I don't even know whether this is true. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you're kind of depleted where the body isn't really releasing any kind of adrenaline anymore. Um, it could be that it's not because you are drained of adrenaline because I have a hard time believing that this is actually a thing. I think that the body maybe calms down a little bit more, realizes that it's not an immediate uh, emergency or so, and that's why it doesn't really send out the, the adrenaline. And then after like two to three hours, it's becoming very, very painful. The skin is already irritated quite a lot whenever he then comes over it again it hurts like very very badly and also you are just like whoo very tired um yeah. and if you then have to keep on going 
that is not fun. But it, uh, it's funny because after two to three hours, it's normally what I've experienced is the case and also what I've heard from other people as well is normally the case when things are getting very, very uncomfortable. Um, for me, the longest session was just because the, it was a guest artist and he was only there, so we needed to get that done. Yeah. Um, and Makes sense. Then also the tattoo artist who did my sleeve and everything, he only gives out like single day um, appointments. So if you want to get something, you have to book the entire day. Unless, of course, I think he will structure it like this. If you have just a small thing, then many people with smaller things are actually being then booked in one day. But if you have something that is a bigger project, you have to stay there for the entire day. And that, that was always something that fucked with me, to be honest, because it's like long training sessions. I don't like long training sessions. I rather split it up into several yeah. sessions. I don't have an issue with that. But sitting there or doing going into the uh, gym for like an, a three-hour session is something that I simply don't like. I can go to the gym twice daily and do two one-and-a-half sessions. No issues whatsoever. Um, but yeah, that, that is something that always kind of fucked with me. It's funny there was definitely in the first half an hour my body was not happy that's where i actually mm. fainted and passed out um and so we had to stop initially and then we stopped again and then that's where i fainted and then after that time i went for like a good hour and a half and that was the best of the entire experience it was just like it was just like happening and i was like it's not even very painful at all mm. and it was smooth sailing and then my body was like starting to kick up a bit of a fuss after that a little bit so i think we had to have two more breaks or something yeah so my, i didn't faint again <laughs> I, I don't know if i've ever told you i i don't think that i did because i can't see the relevance for it <clears throat> um back then when i was actually getting tattooed quite quite on a regular basis and i did my rib cage here on the on the right side um my tattoo artist has a lidocaine which is a substance that is also being used for uh, cocaine production that's why you can't really get it um, from the drugstore yourself you have to be someone who's working in a specific field in order to actually then get a specific amount of lidocaine or a cream that contains like a certain percentage you can still get a cream that only consists or well, contains like 0.5 percent or so he actually had a cream with 20 percent in it what this does is actually it numbs your skin incredibly much it's crazy thing is though that you can't really take too much because it's um it's kind of too it's toxicating if you're taking too much of it and also you have to have a, an open wound so you need to actually do already a little bit of tattooing then he puts the cream on after that you're good for like one to two hours and you don't feel anything at all <laughs> it's great <laughs> i can see it particularly for like the side like the really sensitive areas yeah, yeah. I can't imagine, like, I, d I guess after a while you get, it dulls a little bit because the body's used to it, but initially it must be like, oh my God, like the pain that must bring. Yeah. Well, like Jess, Jess has here done. I'm like, oh, that must have, like, I don't know, that must, that seems like an area would hurt. <laughs> that's true, that's true. But Let's get away from tattooing. For a long-term gain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you want to learn more, I'm going to have my expert Q&A uh, vlog coming yeah, out. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Over You're on the up a, a, a new Join below. Instagram account and account. also a newsletter. <laughs> Inked by Steve or something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so, yeah, how's the chest getting along? How's the recovery? How's yeah, it running? So, how's the mess so, cycle going? Yeah, right now I have the feeling that nothing is really happening anymore at the moment, which is a little bit frustrating, but I think that it's just like the, the last stages of it that now kind of, I don't know, heal up very, very slowly. That's why they probably say like it can take up to like six months before actually seeing the final results because it's still painful at times. It's still oh, numb well. in some areas. So yeah, it's a little bit disheartening that it was kind of, rapid progression and then slowing down and now you can't really see the differences anymore on a weekly basis which is a little bit unfortunate uh, because the right nipple is still like not the greatest it's kind of i don't know it looks very weird <laughs> and uh, i'm hoping that it's getting better at some point but of course overall it's much much better than prior to that this i can say already even if it still continues to look the way that it does right now to be honest um but yeah, um, no, uh, everything else, I mean, I'm now in 
coming up to week number three. Today was a rest day and things are feeling very, very good, but also quite exhaustive. Um, I don't know. I have it every now and then that you start a muscle cycle, you something comes up, right? Something, no matter what it is. You're getting injured, um, you're getting um, severe, um, like, I don't know, sickness or so, surgery, whatever. Then you come out of that one, you are actually kind of very, very fresh from a systemic perspective. Go in there, everything feels productive. You're getting nice doms and all that kind of stuff. And maybe I have the tendency to push too hard. Um, it's always something that haunts me. Um, and it's very, very, very challenging. And that's why I also never understand when someone is telling me that a certain amount of ARIA is not hard. I simply don't get it because whenever I'm going in there, I have... I mean, the listeners know, you know, I've gone through phases where I've lost kind of my eyesight and all that kind of stuff. I'm always falling back to that. But I, I don't feel that it's hard to actually then go to true muscular failure to some extent, right? I always need to kind of hold myself back because I think you've made even a post about it, Steve, or maybe it was in one of your new vlogs or so, uh, where you said that um, on certain lifts, it's very easy to get carried away and actually do more um, than you had planned for. So, for example, on a back movement, um, can quite easily happen that you're actually doing a two aria, but you're telling yourself that it was a four aria. And so th this is where I'm at right now. I'm al I always question myself on that on that front, and this this would be so great in certain in situations like these to have just like an objective eye that just looks over the program and follows along in the spreadsheet to be able to tell like okay that um level of progression is too fast for someone like you it's easier for doing it for other people than for yourself no absolutely it's um First, on the initial point, it was I was kind of smiling when you talked about the exponential recovery and then the plateau because I was just like, man, <laughs> that's literally like newbie gains and then like it slows down <laughs> yeah. and you become disheartened True. with the slow progress. So it so many biological systems must follow that same sort of trajectory actually, where there's like that initial exponential adaptation and then the body's just like, eh, we don't need to prioritize this anymore. It's pretty much there. Like it, it, it's all good. So, but I'm glad it's healing and it hasn't obviously got worse it's just slowly getting better that's that's cool news and hopefully yeah. by the end of like this mesocycle the deload and then the next meso it'll be like you know 90 95 100 percent better i mean uh, it and it looks sorry to interrupt you there i feel so much more conf uh, confident and comfortable now in my skin when it comes to that awesome um now what actually haunts me is this what i talked about last week that it made me realize how much of an impact the loose skin actually has on the way my physique looks. Um, but also at the same time, it, pu it puts things in perspective and my chest was bothering me way more than, for example, my midsection. Sorry, Absolutely. go ahead. No, and then um, on your point in terms of... I actually, it's funny because I think there's a difference between what is objectively hard versus subjectively hard. And what I mean by that is I think for most people listening, leaving, like especially you deload, you're super beat up, but by the end of it, you're really fresh, you're eager, you're like wanting to get into the gym. It's harder to leave reps in reserve to only do a number of sets that just gets you a decent stimulus to just set the foundation for the mesocycle. That's actually harder subjectively. Objectively, it's easier mm. doing less volume, leaving more reps in reserve, objectively, it's easier. But for me, it's always a case where I'm like, like, please don't push too hard that first week for my clients, for myself. Uh, because always, like, always, if I'm in those later weeks, I'm like, I'm so glad that I was like a responsible bodybuilder in the first weeks because now I'm in a really good position here. Whereas sometimes I'm like, fuck's sake, Steve, you've been like trying to progress this movement for the last three weeks normally it's like a back movement and you're just kind of repeat performance repeat performance and it's just a, and now it's feeling off the sfr is dropping off and i'm just like learn from your mistake kind of correct that for next time because yeah it's like you said it's a bit, on pressing movements i find it not too bad to mm -hmm. like leave reps and reserve True. the the pulling ones something just always makes me want to 
keep <laughs> keep <them Yeah>. pulling. <laughs> no, absolutely. And it's so so the the um <clears throat> deviation from perfect or optimal form is also so subtle. And this is something that we've mentioned as well. With pressing movements uh, or pushing movements, also like um leg pushing movements, so much easier to know when it is that you're coming up to your failure point. Whereas with pulling movements, um, the the body is starting to give in more and more. Form is actually breaking down gradually and not just like all of a sudden. And hence, when you're then in the groove, sometimes you won't even notice that, I don't know, on the RDLs, the back feels kind of straight, but it's slowly bending more and more so, right? Maybe not to a significant extent, but enough to take stimulus away then from the hamstrings and put it towards your erectus or so. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of the Revive Stronger member site. Inside you'll find a thriving forum, a growing exercise library, presentations, research reviews and courses. If you want to get involved, sign up via the description. That one is a really good reason why um, one sometimes you know the next day because your erectors mm. are fried and your hamstrings are like what's up <laughs> let's go train uh and also filming your form yeah uh, so important because sometimes like you said it feels decent and then you look back at the form and you're like uh, you look at the video and you're like whoa or other times sometimes it can feel a bit like oh, that didn't feel that great i mm -hmm. think it's off and then you look back and you're like actually that looked really pristine like let's just I would like to hear your thoughts on this one, Steve, um, because I think that this is an individual difference, of course, right? Um, but whenever I'm filming myself, um, I always feel like um, the lift itself, when I'm grinding or so, like grinding in that kind of sense, um, it feels like a lifetime when I'm grinding through it. The last repetitions feel like as if I have a cadence of like five to five or so right five seconds down five seconds up and then i look back on it on the video see the last one and two repetitions and i'm just like man this guy has easily like five six more reps in reserve <laughs> when in reality i know that i i couldn't have done this right what yeah. do you th what do you make of it so yeah for definitely like one that springs to mind immediately was my uh, uh, by the way this is not with all of the lifts this is just okay. with particular yeah, yeah. movements particular body parts rather so i would say for like i wonder if you'd agree with me for hack squats like sometimes like and it will look grindy for sure mm. but i'll look back versus how it felt and i'll be like huh that rep wasn't as grindy as it felt in real yes. time but it's gr grindy enough to know that's a no RL. Hack squats were actually the, the image that I had in my head when I was actually talking you through it. To be or like a too. pendulum squat is the yeah. same way. Even I think it's because... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say there's that like, just once you've gone through the bottom portion, then you come to that sticking point and it's just like, and I guess that's where the rationale becomes behind banding it. So you kind of, this is something actually I noticed was um, the lying leg press that I do my failure looked very different to the hack squat. And mm. it's because the lying leg press doesn't have like a clear just sticking point. It's mm. very like even throughout the range of motion in terms of tension. And so my last rep was just like, it was slow-ish, but f it felt like absolute hell in the process. Whereas yeah, some lifts, like you said, like the hack squat has a clear sticking point if you don't band yeah. it or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes, so the, th the funny thing is that you always are at least that's the case with me and um, that i'm constantly um doubting myself right because um i'm quite confident in the things that i do know but i'm also quite confident that there are so many things that i don't know in particular when it comes to exercise science we know that there's so much stuff we still don't know yet and because of that i'm i'm still looking around and be like hmm, maybe there is something but this is kind of a fallacy and kind of it isn't because there's probably be something that you as an individual still could be doing that is then giving you more. But is it the things that you are looking for or is it something that you are absolutely unaware of? So let me let me put it this way. Right now, when researchers are looking for something, they are only looking for the things that they think about or that they are aware of. 
but it could easily be that we don't have the technology yet or have even an idea about something that is out there, and that's why we are unaware of that. Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, it's one thing that comes to mind, you'll probably remember this, is um, Mike uh, Zudos said like his DUP study came out and it was very favorable and people were like, oh, so this is how you should approach DUP. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, this is the best one we have to date, but we haven't mm -hmm. looked at everything yet. So yeah. it's very much along those lines of yeah. this is what we think. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> best um, this now. is a common thing um, in, of course, research, um, especially amongst... Um, astrophysicists is it astrophysicists so f f physics in general i don't know what the english definition for it is uh, when it comes to people who are looking in space and all that kind of stuff sounds right um there are so many things that we are we well those um, researchers don't know about space yet right and that's why when they observe the universe they can of course only look at the things that they have a theory about or the things that they have observed already. Finding something um, that you've never seen before is quite hard because you don't know what it is that you're looking for. And that sometimes also then applies to me and training. I don't know whether there is something that I'm missing. And hence, that's why I don't know what it is that I'm looking for. Right? And it could be then also there that I'm looking for something that is simply not even there or present, you know? And, and I think that this may also apply to a lot of people. They are always in constant search for something. And that's why they are then jumping from one thing to the other. But because we have gone through that part or that process already in the past, so we've tried several diets or different form of diets, we've tried several supplements. And of course, with newly gained knowledge comes also... Um, the, your view at the world becomes a little bit clearer, right? But still, of course, the world is so big that you will never be able to see it all in your entire life. Um, but you can only try your very best to discover as many things for yourself as possible. But uh, because of that, yeah, once again, sometimes I'm just like looking at the form videos, looking at, of course, once again, also then the training approach in it for itself. And I'm thinking like, huh, can I do something for myself that will then also help other people? Or is that something that I just like need to, I mean, I'm just still ticking off the boxes and I don't know where I want to go with this, but it's more like, um, yeah, that, that we are sometimes really very much caught in our own head and that maybe because of that, we are actually not um, making as much progress as we would like to. Don't know if that made sense. Yeah, I think it's, I think there's a fine line, like you said there, there's, there's an amount of confidence you want to have in your training approach that it's providing you results, because if you're not confident in it, it's unlikely you're going to apply yourself to it properly. And also I find kind of the mind, the body follows mind. So if you're very unconfident in what you're doing is going to provide results, it's probably un unlikely it will. Whereas you should be somewhat confident, but you shouldn't be so confident that you're dogmatic and you're ignoring new research and new ideas that are coming out there. And maybe rather than what you said and what we learned from, don't jump programs and kind of go to something else and try something else every few weeks, stick to the same kind of core principles you know that you're confident in yeah. and try messing around and incorporating <laughs> these other things here or there potentially. That's, that's at least how I tend to like to do it. But yeah, it's... <laughs> to stray too far from the core fundamentals that have worked so well for me, it's like tricky. If I was to think, I don't know, like Brad Schoenfeld has his max muscle plan. I'd find it really a difficult sell to be like, Steve, why don't you just, like it's Brad Schoenfeld. This is like, he's like fucking smart. He's got this hypertrophy program. I could follow a strength phase, a metabolite phase and like a general hypertrophy phase. But I'm just like, but, I don't want to do that because what I'm doing, I think is actually absolutely fine. And it's been working for a long time. Mm. And actually I followed something somewhat similar to what Brad's um, suggested there anyway. I'm sure both would work. And there's probably like a lot of these things right now, a lot of them are just going to work <laughs> as yeah. long as you apply yourself to it. Like we know, like hypertrophy and bodybuilding is such a forgiving adaptation. You just need to make sure you're doing enough and you're working hard enough yeah. and you're probably going to grow. <laughs> absolutely. And that's, 
So this is where my confidence also then stems from. So the things yeah. that I'm doing right now, it's not that I'm questioning it to such an extent that I'm looking for something else. Um, and it's also not that I think that it doesn't really provide any kind of progress because I do believe that this, what I'm doing right now, is stimulative. And it's more like those small minor things, those very small details, which in and for itself, if you really think about it, don't really make that much of a difference. And basically also uh, it would fall back to what it is that we've talked about the last time, about the fallacy of thinking that if it gives me 5%, then I'm willing to do it. But if you can't really quantify it and measure it, how do you know that this actually is beneficial and not detrimental? Because that could have actually be the case as well here with something like training as well. Because the things that you're doing today is what will cause the adaptations in a couple of weeks from now. Um, and you won't be able to to really quantify that or um, measure it against another. Right? That's why you can only kind of try, and I, I know that it's kind of a lazy intellectual statement, but trust the process. And it really falls back to what it is that you said. Um, ticking off the fundamental boxes, and then the rest is up for the things that Mike actually talked about in the, the recent um, Q&A that we did, episode 301 that will come out, about like what training actually mostly depends on. And that is yeah. genetics. Um, what what else was it? Genetics, drugs, and time. And right. time. Yeah, time. Right? And if you're then following the basic principles of like training hard and relatively smart and spending or doing that long enough you will probably see the results and what the results then look like is then dependent on genetics and then possibly even drug use or no drug use depending on whether you are an enhanced athlete or not yeah it's it's so true and i think people really enjoy that discussion that we had surrounding that because it can be a bit of a mind fuck, especially because, yeah, you just start doubting yourself, question yourself. And when you get too far into that rabbit hole, it can be really dangerous, which is why I think people come to us for a coach because they look at us and they want that person they trust in their corner. And then they feel they can trust the process and what's going on and feel confident that that person is doing everything to the best of their ability to help them. And they stop being their own worst enemy in terms of questioning everything they're doing and being like, oh, this guy said this, but this guy said this, but they're all smart. They're all jacked and they're all getting results. It's like, ah, uh, <laughs> like, what should I do? It's funny though, because it's kind of the opposite and the other, um, other way around when it comes to drug usage as well, though, because so many people abuse then the drugs see great results and come to the conclusion that what, what it is that they are doing right now is actually kind of the best thing ever at the right way of training and drawing them the conclusions around this. And this is, of course, not not, not what it's like, but yeah, you, you see then the, the complication in the situation itself because not only does that individual uh, draw the conclusions around it, maybe spreading then the word around it, but then other less clued up people are then drawing that conclusion as well and preaching it even more. And it's becoming kind of a kind of a pyramid scheme where it's like one person at the top says one thing and then all the other people underneath him are just like spreading it like wildfire when in reality it's not even true. So kind of basic principles of something like fake news nowadays. People aren't really double checking the sources anymore, or the credibility and the 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 um, the truth of the, the sources anymore. They're just like I don't know, even quoting a text, quoting a study, and take it for granted that what this person said was actually the truth, when maybe it wasn't. Yeah, I think it. Now I think about it, probably a lot of individuals on a high amount of gear or with very good genetics, they probably, because they're, you could then say in those scenarios, they're probably getting results almost despite what they're doing. It doesn't really matter. They're probably just training to absolute preference. And so what you see in some people then equate causation and correlation, they're like, oh, so I must train like that. And it's just like, well, he's, and I think that's why a lot of guys on gear, like they don't pay attention to it the same way naturals do necessarily. And like the nutritional variables as well, because so much is taken care of to allow for results that they don't need to worry about because 
in some ways you could equate drugs to having good genetics. They just give you a leg up. And so it makes everything matter much less that you're doing. Whereas if you're a natural, you don't have that and you don't have good genetics. You have to focus on all the little things that do something. And then someone will look at that person who's focusing on all the, the details. Like we might be those individuals who are like taking it too far, thinking about it too much. And it's like, but if we didn't do any of that, you think we'd be bigger? You think we'd be mm. bigger if we didn't like know as much about the, the science and the data and stuff? Uh, I, I think sometimes that's why that correlation happens as well. The skinny guys are seen as like the bookworms. But it's like, but they, they have to go to that source because they can't rely on anything else. Sometimes, not always. I, I, th I think though, uh, to be fair, I, I don't think that it's a fair um, fair statement to make that the most enhanced or most enhanced guys are less clued up um and don't really think as much about those th things and most natural guys are I, I think it's not a really fair statement to be honest um it may be that it's more of a cause and effect where it's like we so someone who's genetically not as blessed um and who decides to not go down the drug route he has only one solution and that is to educate himself and due to that, he's then gaining more knowledge. It could be that he didn't go down that drug road because of uh, legal consequences, maybe, because he didn't have access to that. What if he was in a scenario or environment where he, where he could have actually gotten the drugs? Right? Maybe he would have still go down the education route while then starting to take steroids or so. Um, same goes then. There are lots of natural athletes out there who are also still as clueless as many enhanced guys and that's why um when I, whenever someone is actually saying then those bigger guys um they don't really know what they are doing or so i i don't really think that it's a f fair statement because probably there are still uh, as many naturals who are as clueless as there are enhanced people and maybe it's actually the, the other way around that there are more clued up enhanced people because they are more dedicated. They've made that decision of wanting to get bigger and that's why they're actually putting more work and effort in, in learning more about it. Could be, right? I'm just putting it out there and playing a little bit of devil's advocate because I think we are always kind of, or we, and I, I'm speaking about us as a community now, so to speak, um, we are guilty of being judgmental in many ways as well without us wanting to be judgmental but this is just because we have a certain image in our head that is not really matching reality yeah i think um i agree because a lot of people will make broad statements that i'm like how can you possibly know that <laughs> you can't possibly know that um like <laughs> most people don't need to like, like I, I see so many people training not very hard. So I think most people don't need to deload. I'm like, yeah, but you're in your microcosm in that little mm -hmm. gym. Like you don't know exactly. how the rest of the world are training. Um, I think the perspective I was coming from was unfortunately I see um, younger lifters getting into things and some of them looking for a shortcut, which they then go down the anabolic route and they never really push themselves down the natural route and mm -hmm. educate themselves a little bit. And then they just fall into that, oh, so to get results, I just need to take more and more and more. And I think that's that's more so the kind of the, the perspective I was coming from versus like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, just take Mike, for example. Yeah. He might be one, he's definitely one of the most, like so the smartest individuals I've ever met and certainly surrounding hypertrophy. And I mean, yeah, he's certainly enhanced. So I yeah. definitely can't make that that judgment at all. And I'm like, like, you know, I'm certainly wouldn't judge anyone for- No, absolutely. Uh, not off the face of it, at least. I might, if I knew their reasons for going down yeah. that route and if they hadn't really thought about it, then yeah, sure, I'm going to end up some judgment there. But not just like, if, so, if I, like I'm friends, I have friends who are enhanced, like there's nothing... Like, it's when Mike was talking to me about it, I said on the episode as well, I was like, I'm sold. I was literally, as he was talking <laughs> it through, I was like, fuck, that just sounds yeah. like so much fun. But then he obviously kind of pulled us back and re like showed all yeah. the, the possible cons as well. So it's definitely a good episode to listen to. No, absolutely. And I was never thinking that you are being judgmental, but that is exactly the problem, right? That we yeah. sometimes, it's exactly that bubble, bubbly Nesh kind of thinking. Uh, we are not thinking outside the bubble. We perceive um, 
things that are around us and think that the world is then a certain way. When in reality, this is just like a very, very minor part of it. Um, especially like social media, right? Um, you're following some high level natural bodybuilders, maybe some high level IFBB pros, and you don't really know anything about like the other side of like fitness influencers. I have no idea what's out there. And probably this is a shit show, for example, right? But this is what I mean. There's a, a, an entire different kind of niche probably out there that we are clueless and unaware about. And that's why um, I want to be careful with actually making statements like these because there's probably a huge bunch of natural athletes out there. Um, and I don't want to also categorize because then I would be ending up being a hypocrite, being the exact person or being the basically the same person as the people that I'm criticizing of thinking in categories and creating kind of tribals or tribalism overall. And that is something that I want to avoid as well, right? And that's why I, I just want to be careful with statements like these um, because I think that we all need to always remind ourselves like there's a world outside of our bubble. We definitely need to take that into consideration. But at the same time, of course, we can. There's something that is called, of course, sample size that is being used also for then marketing polls, for then studies. And based off of that, you can create a good representation of what the audience, what the, I don't know, your your the, the British people are thinking, right? It's not that they are asking every UK citizen or so for their opinion. It's more like they are taking a sample size of like maybe 2,000 um, randomly picked British citizens and based off of that they are then creating like a result and that's the same here as well i mean generally speaking what i've observed so far is then holding true to your statements but that doesn't mean that this is truly then matching reality it could be that the sample size was just like in favor of those individuals who think a specific way in a really random way to like loop this all up together <laughs> of what we talked about earlier like it tattooing obviously is like a little bit of a body enhancement and you are like changing your physiology in some way because now your skin wouldn't normally be like that mm. and having done that it did make it, it kind of it, i could see how little things like that could lead you down a bit of a rabbit hole mm. where it's like oh i could do that oh what if i like i don't know i could get this piercing oh i could take that drug and it could do this to my physique and like you can start like building something that is not just natural um so yeah it's you know i don't know yeah it's it's crazy to think about it really hey pascal here i just quickly wanted to remind you of our online coaching service at revive stronger we put a huge emphasis on the personal aspect of our coaching and if you want to take your physique and knowledge to the next level Hit the link in the description below. Yeah, but I mean, I don't want to really go down too much now that lane, but it is also then applying to everything that we have seen over the past two years when it comes to conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. Uh, social media, due to how the algorithms work, they actually um, are a very big cause for people getting into extreme um, opinions and also camps because they are let down that path unintentionally by algorithms just by the way algorithms work and those people are working in those companies sometimes don't even know themselves how the algorithms work anymore because it's such an automated process already right and it's such a complex tree of things and yeah once you're caught in that web it's very, very hard to get out of it. And we know this. Everyone kind of knows this because you guys are listening to something like Spotify, like YouTube, and they are giving you always recommendations for the things that you may like as well, right? And it doesn't really check the credibility of the source or so. And that's why we can always then, once we are stepping into a certain bubble, um, we are most of the time really going deep there if we want to. And it's then very much hard to really truly build your own opinion of something. Even if you think it's your own opinion. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I have to say on that. Steve, Steve. man. <laughs> uh, so where can we move this conversation I, I, to? I have a good idea, Steve. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, I, I had something on my mind of like things that I wanted to talk about with you on the Improvement Season podcast that people could enjoy. And that is going through all of the body parts. Of course, not in one single episode, but each and every single episode, maybe talking about one body part and how to train and attack that one in the most efficient manner, tips and tricks on what helped you the most, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, what do you think about it? Now that we only have like 15 minutes left, maybe we should pick a body part that isn't really as complex and complicated. We can't really mess things up too much. But uh, so let's start with maybe forearms or cars, something like that. (laughs) Imagine forearms. Um, It's actually funny. Let's go with forearms only because um, one of my clients this week asked me, should I be training my forearms? Like I've seen like, like, I don't know, I isolate my calves, abs, traps maybe should i be doing my forearms and I, he's dieting right now and i was mm-hmm. just like not you can, like i was like to be very honest with you the cost of training your forearms is very little it's probably more psychological than anything it's mm-hmm. just fucking boring and time um yeah and time like that, that's the, they're the costs really because really like i've trained my forearms and quite a bit and they don't get they, they don't get sore no. like they don't really fatigue you very much so it's only you, you could fuck up if you like train your forearms before your pool session or before I don't know, before a pool session maybe, but then you use versa grips or something. So exactly. it kind of negates just that becoming, yeah, ne- negates that being too much of an issue. So there's something if you want, like anything, if you want more of it, like isolate it because the MRV of a forearm, I fucking can't imagine. It's probably like a hundred sets or something yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Just, just on a side uh, note, buddy, when I was still playing in a band, and I was a bass guitar player. My forearms, when I haven't played in a long time, were cramping up all the time. Because you, I was playing, like, especially when we had band, band practice or especially when we had a concert and I, we haven't given a concert in a very long time and you were active, you were quite intense on stage. It cramps up, but if you're playing them for like one to two, yeah, one to two hours, it's not a really a surprise. The forearms are continuously doing something, right? And that's why, just to bring it up as an example, if you're then also doing like band practice, like for four or five hours, or you're recording something for such a long time, I mean, the forearms can take a beating. It's the same when it comes to cars. Yeah. Yeah, because, so it's kind of one of those muscle groups where I'd say, uh, and I said this to him actually, I often find when I have been training them, my elbows, uh, sorry, my wrists, and I have big wrists that can take a beating, my wrists start giving up before my forearms give up quite often. Like they just start getting painful. So like for sure, they're definitely something you can isolate and train, but the costs are time and like psychological effort. And to be honest, you get a lot of like just forearm growth through your bicep curling, through your pulling. Um, It's mostly isometric contractions, of course. You'll get maybe if you do like alternating curls and stuff, you get some, a little bit of dynamic contraction, but nothing too much. So I do think if you want them to be like Popeye big forearms, you're going to want to isolate them. Um, And then I don't know if you want to touch on that or if I can go on to like no, no, general let, recommendations. Let, let's let's stay with the forearms. I think that we can talk, oh, no. talk and cover more. Oh, yeah. sorry. I meant like, should I go on to like my programming recommendations? Yes, or yes, yeah. exactly. Cool. So yeah, I found, um, I would say at least like twice a week, like you can probably go up to, you possibly could go up to a stupid number, but I would say like two to four, but start with two. And I mostly like um, flexion, so not extending back. Mm. Like I, I don't think the extensors are probably a huge majority of like your forearm chunk and the area you want big is more like the flexion portion. So like the inside of your forearm versus the outside of your forearm. It's kind of like training, uh, what's it called? Um, plantar flex, uh, no, dorsiflexion for training like the front side of your um, uh, calf. Like you don't like training that it doesn't really have bodybuilding purpose so Mm. it's the same kind of principle with that and so i i mean i've tried a variety of things i find barbell curl uh like barbell forearm curls to hurt my left wrist quite often it's just a bit uncomfortable easy bar is much much better with just having that camber just puts you in a much um kind of more comfortable position um you can do dumbbell curls as well standing these can all be standing or my favorite is like a single arm dumbbell curl over a bench that works really well but i do get pain in my left wrist very often Mm -hmm. building up from that 
and then cables work super well. Uh, cables I really like. Uh, you can get a really good pump. And I personally find I can go as low as 10 reps, but it just doesn't feel very good. It just kind of feels wrong. I could like 15 plus reps, generally higher repetitions for forms. And it kind of makes sense thinking about how much they're used, that they might be a bit more slow twitch dominant, and maybe they respond better to higher repetitions and they really respond well to like metabolite techniques. So maybe like a Meyer rep method. And that's something I'd really actually say if people want to try it and they don't want to spend too much time, Meyer reps are great because just kind of rep out a kind of activation set and then you can do like three or four cluster mm. sets. It's like, oh, my forearms now have a massive pump. I've got some good stimulus there, but it's not taking me like, don't know how long it would take to do straight sets. So I'd quite like programming that. But yeah, I start like two to three sets, two times a week, and then just kind of auto-regulate as you normally would for a, a muscle group. I quite like those exercises I talked about. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else to be, like I said, like programming, like we mentioned, if you've got Versa grips and stuff, it almost doesn't matter too much. And mm. the only thing that's ever made my forearm sore is because I was in a leg press and holding super <laughs> fucking tight. And that made them sore. I was like, what? I, I was so c confused why they're tight. And then I was leg pressing again and I went to grab and I was like, oh my God, that's mm. why they're sore. Mm. I've never got sore from actual like flexion of the forearms. Okay. How, for how long, uh, how long have you been training your forearms for? Are you still doing it? Yes. Um, man, how long has it been? Definitely over a year. I did them for, I actually, I'm going to sound hypocritical here because I just told my client not to train them when he was <laughs> dieting, but he could. Um, I trained them when I was doing my entire contest prep okay. and I've been training them ever since. So I've probably been training them for like two years now. Okay. And have you found, because one year can be a decent amount of time, have you found any kind of things that you did when you started out? that you're not doing anymore because you have learned something about it on, I don't know, how to target the best things to avoid, et cetera, et cetera. So actually really good point because whilst you don't necessarily have to worry about it impacting like a pool session the next day, you probably want to train them last within a session. Not that mm. I ever didn't do this, but someone might like, they're like, I want huge forearms, so I'll train them first in the session. Sure, but you might end up fucking the rest of your session over because just because there'll be such a kind of metabolic stress buildup. Even if you've got grips in that session, you'll probably find your grip will fatigue first. And you, mm. you don't want that to happen. So train them last within a session uh, is advisable. And then the main thing I found was the wrists. Be, be delicate about the wrists. So dumbbells are great because you can kind of use whatever grip on that. So it's, it's probably steer clear of straight bars. Um, I would generally say try them like, but for me that just ended up hurting my wrist and i was doing extension initially and i just found extension just seemed like a waste of time mm. so i just ended up doing more flexion um and don't stress about it like if you miss them or if you haven't got time or like anything it's they're kind of like just a little bonus so if you have the time you can go and do them uh it's, it's not at the end of the world because yeah you can get i'm one of those guys that's very anal about doing everything but sometimes like yeah. i don't know i, I can't do it because of time limitations or something don't yeah. stress about it they're the main things i think okay and when would you recommend to incorporate that or consider incorporating it into the program and when would you say don't stress about it so like i said if i guess the assumption is you've got the time and you psychologically are prepared to go through something very boring mm. and you want bigger forearms so if that is the case i would say generally it wants to be done in a mass phase because it's very unlikely that you're going to gain additional forearm size in a cut. You could initially for sure. Um, and there's nothing against doing it during a cut phase, but you'll probably maintain your forearm size through all your pulling and mm -hmm. everything else. Even if you're using things like Versa grips, I don't see you losing forearm size unless you have ridiculously huge forearms and that's been produced through stupid amounts of isolation so your mev is like really high uh, i don't think that's going to be the case so i would say generally like time psychologically prepared you want bigger forearms during a mass phase probably later in your career versus earlier but i can't really think of a good rational reason to why someone couldn't do it earlier in their career if they really want big forearms mm. that's probably still going to maximize their growth i just generally wouldn't want those individuals to like focus on such things as much as just like 
being more proficient in the gym and a better yeah. trainee and focusing on quality reps and nailing their nutrition. So I'd say it's more of an advanced concern. Yeah, makes sense. Everything makes sense. And especially like <clears throat> if you really want to commit the time. The thing is, I think that you need to be aware of that if you commit to something like that, you don't just do it for like one to two mesocycles. cycles. You probably want to commit to it like probably for then maybe the rest of your training career or so, right? To really then reap the rewards and yeah. benefits of it. Because if you want to make an uh, adjustment like this or incorporation of something like this, it's not just like, yeah, I have now the time and now the mental capacity of doing so. But once I don't, then I stop doing it again. And then I incorporate that again. It's kind of then off on mentality. I don't find it to be good as well. And just to play a little bit of devil's advocate of then um, saying like, okay, is there a necessity for it? Um, I think we have very good evidence now from certain studies showing the correlation between then um, pulling movements, pushing movements, having a carryover effect into certain muscle groups. And it's super interesting when you're just taking a look at studies who then show um, the bicep growth, for example, when you're just doing rowing movements. And it's actually quite fascinating on how much of a stimulus is still provided to then the bicep area with indirect work. And then you can always play it like this also when it comes to abs, for example. Abs are a typical thing where people are saying like, if you do like heavy compound lifts, you don't need to train the abs. Yes, that's there's some truth to it, absolutely. If you have also well-developed apps, you probably don't even need to do any additional work to keep those very well-developed apps. But if you have shitty apps, you probably need to still work it to some extent. And maybe the same applies to then something like um, forums as well. Now, forums, on the other hand, I think when you have like very big biceps or very big arms, I would be very surprised if you have like tiny forearms to be honest. With abs though, if you have a very, very big squat, very big deadlift, you probably still have a decent um, decent app development. Maybe it's not the greatest, hypertrophically speaking, but I think it's still a little bit of a different scenario with abs than it is for forearms. I would very much have a hard time believing that you have like massive bicep, massive tricep, and tiny forearms. And that's why I'm most of the time erring on the side of like focus on getting big as big as possible right if you because i've never seen a huge guy with tiny forearms and i could be completely falling into a trap and a fallacy here and my rationale and logic behind it but that's just how i see things when it comes to at least forearm training wondering it's like um because of certainly you could have massive it's the same you could have big hamstrings glutes calves uh, sorry <laughs> massive glu uh, glutes hamstrings and quads you could have tiny calves mm. like definitely seen that so same with the abs like absolutely seen that but forearms at least n equals one my forearms have always been reasonably big and i have quite reasonably big biceps um but i think the the thing i would say is like if you are looking to it's kind of like i don't know even when you're looking at supplements we probably would recommend that you nail down everything before supplements in terms of calories, macros, nutrient timing, all those factors. Same with training forearms. You probably, not saying you have to do this, but you probably want to have everything else covered in terms of muscle groups. And you're training them to their maximum before you consider then tagging along mm. your, your forearms. Because it's like, I don't know, someone might go and train their forearms for five sets or something. It's like, could you have done more arm work? Isn't that probably preferable having... Like, and, and if you could have, couldn't you have been like benefited from that more? It's probably going to help your bodybuilding career more if you are a bodybuilder versus having bigger forearms. If you have a bigger, just complete arm, because I don't think judges really fucking look at your for forearms. Yeah. But and it might complement an overall more aesthetic look. But yeah, but that's the question then, right? Because arm training is also not super exhaustive. So instead of using that time to train, like, I don't know, do three sets of forearms, which are not psychologically super demanding, which are not systemically super demanding, you could also make the argument of like maybe doing one additional set 
instead of three sets. For, so one additional set for then the bicep and the tricep may then have enough of a carryover effect such as doing three sets of forearm training. I don't think that is like a direct um, comparison. I think, of course, when you work a specific muscle group directly to a high extent that you will get more hypertrophic stimulus there. But um, will that really make that much of a visual difference at some point? I don't know. I don't know. Right? I really really wish and i'm kind of glad you didn't ask me but i'm going to bring it up i wish i'd measured them before i started mm. training them because i didn't um i don't know how, are you and this is a maybe the last point we can talk about are you good at taking your own measurements pascal absolutely not <laughs> same here i'm really same bad as, at them as same well. as you were with the recommendation you gave to your client about not training the four rounds in the cutting phase i'm the same when it comes to like girth measurements i am I, the thing is i wanted to actually do it for the last cutting phase i didn't even do it once yeah yeah i says I it always, all. and i'm not that i i don't know how where you are with this either with clients, I'm very strict on, I want photos. Yeah. Measurements, if they don't want to do them, I'm not that big of a stickler. I like having them because mm. I think they're a useful additional marker, especially in some scenarios. They can be pretty helpful, especially having the waist measurements. But for me, I've never seen huge amounts of value for myself personally in taking measurements. So like, I, because I get asked all the time, like, what's your bicep measurement? I'm like, I just don't measure it. Like, mm. I just don't. I've never seen the huge amounts of value in that uh, that I can't get from other things. Um, but yeah, that's. I'm glad you're in the same sort of position as I am in a sense. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So <laughs> on that on that terrible note of being hypocrites nearly the entire show, <laughs> um, we will end it here. So guys, as always, thank you very much for tuning in. Leave a like, leave a subscription and also a comment section below. Um, we are working on also improving once again our um, newsletter. It has been a long time since we've been quite active over on the newsletter side. We're trying to now change things a little bit up on that front. So make sure to also then subscribe to the newsletter over on our website. And also um, be on the lookout for this year's London seminar, which will be going down and we will make some announcements soon so um yeah be on the lookout for this one very very excited i am like me too. Got <laughs> seminar blue balls <laughs> absolutely <laughs> cool so guys i guess we speak to you guys soon cheers cheers guys So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger, to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people. Uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically, we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is going to be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there. You can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also going to be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics, discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're going to have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're going to go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. 
I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.